uh, from Dharamshala. Um, and there is this understanding between um, between uh, Dharamshala uh, and India um, that at the moment Tibetans uh, are simply living in India as as a refugee community, and their health, uh, their rehabilitation are of India's concern, and uh, Tibetans are called the guest of India, and you know it's a uh, overstaying a guest for almost about 60 years. Uh, uh, but then there's an under understanding, and uh, India has been putting pressure on the Tibetans not to do what is called the end. Uh, anti-China activities uh, from Indian soil. And that's mainly because India has this, India and China share uh, one China policy, one India policy. But at the same time, after the re recent Galwan Valley massacre, uh, many of the Indian intellectuals, uh, strategic uh, analysts have been saying that they must, India must now use the Tibet card against China and should make uh, China pay or uh, for um, for making that aggression on on the border and also um, leading uh, the difficult situation as it's uh, now going on. Um, so let me come to the uh, to the larger issue today, um, because most people are not aware of Tibet. So I did a little presentation on on Tibet. So here is the is the is the map of China with its occupied countries. So look at it very carefully. So um uh this is a map of china today including the occupation of these um, uh, of these countries so uh, tibet as i said earlier it's 2.5 million square kilometer of land then to the uh, northwest of tibet it's uh, chinese occupied east turkestan which is 1.8 million square kilometer of land yeah 18 lakh square kilometer of land yeah and then um, to the northeast of Tibet is uh, what is called Inner Mongolia, or they call Southern Mongolia, uh, because it's the south of uh, the Mongolia, which is now free and independent and, and a democracy uh, on the outside. And that um, Mongolia is usually dependent on Chinese economy, so therefore they are not able to do anything to liberate uh, southern Mongolia, which is under Chinese occupation. And southern Mongolia is 1.2 million square kilometer of land. It's 12 lakh square kilometer of land. To the uh, to the east of southern Mongolia is Manchuria. Now, now to understand Manchuria is so very important for India today, uh, because when we talk about Manchuria, Manchuria is the, is the <clears throat> most important connecting point which got lost in history because it was it was Manchuria who used to rule over China and today that entire Manchuria is under Chinese occupation and um, I will talk more about it uh, later as we go about so Manchuria is 84,000 square kilometer of land and then to the south is the main China and um, if you actually see the border between uh, China and, and uh, Manchuria, that border is exactly where the Great Wall of China is. The Great Wall of China, which is considered the biggest human creation uh, in the world, which can be seen from the moon, as uh, legend as legend says, this seven thousand square kilometer of uh, this seven thousand kilometer of. Uh, uh, great him uh, this uh, great um, wall of china starts from the from the southern part of manchuria uh, and goes all across north of china and goes in uh, almost into tibet and that wall was built because china was making that as a border to protect uh, them the mainland china because they were considering Mongolians and the Tibetans as invaders. And they had Mongolians and the Tibetans uh, because they were horse riding warriors. They used to invade many parts of China um, and um, rob them of wealth. Um, so therefore they built that. But today that Great Wall of China has become only a mon monument and it's not a border. So you see the real China is only 40%, 40% uh, 
60% of China is occupied country. And the model of People's Republic of China is based on former Soviet Union, which collapsed in 89, 90. There was a time when, um, when 17 uh, countries tumbled out of uh, Soviet Union and became free and independent. Um, at the time, people were shocked. How did it happen? Uh, because they always thought Soviet Union was one big building block, like how the rest of the world look at China as one monolithic country. And that is, uh, that is, that is wrong, because they, they don't know uh, what China really composes of. China is composed of the, chi of, of, the, of the real country of China and occupied countries. And for, for trading purpose, for trade benefits, for supply chain, all the international communities today recognize all these occupied countries as part of China, as one China, one China policy. That's exactly the idea of one China policy. Uh, China is so very insecure that people may start to support and recognize these uh, uh, former independent countries. Uh, so therefore, China has to, uh, when, when China deals with any of the foreign countries, they always make it a precondition to make people recognize uh, China in that manner. Uh, this is a picture of German Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel uh, showing a map of China and um, uh, gifted this to Xi Jinping. And this was a, a tacit uh, diplomatic uh, hint uh, to Xi Jinping um, that the real China is only 40 percent and the rest are occupied countries. It's a historic map that and uh, Angela Merkel presented as a gift to Xi Jinping. Now look at this map uh, of China today. So you see, um, so these are these are different provinces that have been cut up into so many different places, um, but showing truly uh, all the occupied countries as parts of China. But if you actually look at uh, this, um, you know, properly, you see East Turkestan, which is an Islamic country, uh, Uyghur people live there. And some of you may have heard of uh, the news that uh, one million Uyghur people have been uh, jailed, um, kept in concentration camps uh, to change their um, uh, Islamic thought. And uh, they have been again and again tagged and troubled as, as terrorists. So um, in, in East Turkestan, uh, people are not allowed to wear, wear, women are not allowed to wear burqa men are not allowed to wear, uh, may, uh, keep their dari, uh, they are not allowed to observe Ram, Ramzan, um, children are not allowed to go to mosque, they have been told you have to go to school, you, uh, you cannot do that. And all these attempts um, are to, uh, you know, deprive of the people of uh, East Turkestan, mainly the Mughur, uh, Uyghur Muslims, uh, of their religion, identity, culture, and homogenize, make them look like, act like, same like that of the Chinese, homogenize them as Chinese, so that they can rule over them. Because culture is giving them a separate and different, different identity. And they did the same thing in Tibet. But in Tibet, it was a failure. Uh, whatever they did, the Tibetans were hugely resilient without resorting to violence. Yeah, so this is East Turkestan. East Turkestan for China is the main source of income for its natural resources uh, like oil and natural gas and some precious stones. Um, uh, from Urumqi, uh, the oil and natural gas pipeline goes all across the length of China and goes to Shanghai. So, uh, so East Turkestan is like that uh, for China. Uh, Next, we see uh, Mongolia. Mongolia is a pasture land. Uh, and again, very important source of oil, natural gas, and uranium. Uh, China has found such important source of uranium from Mongolia. Mongolia, because of its uh, pasture land, green grass, um, uh, low land compared to Tibet, so therefore, Mongolia, in, into Mongolia, they had built railways much earlier. So therefore, uh, what is called in, national integration had happened. And um, 
most of the Mongolians today do, do not speak their own language, although they are hugely emotional about Mongolian identity, their culture, and their aspiration for, for independence. Manchuria, uh, uh, the importance is this is the country that ruled over China, but today they have completely lost everything. Today, if you go to Manchuria, people will associate themselves more as Chinese. And uh, uh, racially, they may say, oh, we were Mong uh, Manchus one point of time. Now, youngsters do not speak uh, Ma uh, Manchu language. Um, and uh, this has been completely integrated into mainland China. Uh, but some people do say, oh, you know, we are Manchus. We look different and we are different culture. Look at this uh, historical map of, uh, of, of Asia, uh, including Hindustan, Tibet, China, and then um, Burma. Yeah, look at this. It's a historic map where Tibet is clearly shown as a free and independent country. And China, look at the, look at the borders that have been demarcated here. China is very squarely placed in their own situation. This was the, this is the 1800 uh, picture. Uh, at the time, it was the waning power of the Manchus uh, who were ruling over China. So there was no China there at the time. It was China under Manchu occupation. So therefore, uh, China at the time was in a pathetic situation where some of the most important uh, trading ports have been uh, divided, cut up and divided among Western uh, colonial uh, powers. And this is the time when uh, what is now called cutting up of Chinese melon. Uh, this was this was this was the time, and towards the end of the 19th century was the Boxer Revolution. Um, um, so this was in a in a this was the time when China was in a terrible situation, um, and that was the time when Tibet was free and independent, um, and uh, Hindustan, India was under the British Empire. Um, so you see, at the time, both China and India were not free, but Tibet was. So this is the map of Tibet that uh, that I had earlier promised to, uh, to show you. So look at this. Where is Nepal? Where is Bhutan? And where is the size of Tibet? You know, 2.5 million square kilometers of land. Such a big country. But most of Tibet is a uh, cold desert. Cold desert. Um, so major portion of Tibet is uninhabitable uh, place. Uh, you know, nothing grows there. It's windswept, especially um, the central and uh, central western uh, plains of, of Tibet. Nothing grows there. It is just cold desert, and during winter, it's just snow and, uh, you know, windswept uh, snow. Um, people, most of the uh, Tibetans, they live in uh, southern part of Tibet, closer to India, Nepal, and Bhutan, and to the eastern part of Tibet, much of the Tibetan population are there in eastern part of Tibet. Today, uh, Tibet had been cut up into five different portions, and what is called Tibet Autonomous Region is right here. In the, right, do you see this line right in the middle coming down, and then uh, coming down towards um, the Yangtze River, and this major portion is called the Tibet Autonomous Region. That kind of uh, administrative, uh, you know, uh, demarcation happened in 1965. So Tibet had been cut up into five different portions, and major portions of Tibet had been attached to traditional Chinese uh, provinces. So um, in real, it, the, uh, you know, uh, the idea of Tibet had been uh, diluted uh, in that way. Uh, but wherever the Tibetans are, Tibetans are hugely emotional about their identity and culture. So they had never been giving up. Now let, let us look at India China uh, so I so I, I've gone to China I'm coming to India today uh, uh, briefly and then we'll again go, go we'll have to go back to China in understanding it so in here um, the red lines are the borders Tibet and India share you know one of the mistakes and serious mistakes every Indian is making is everybody saying China border China border China border क्या चाइना बॉर्डर है चाइना के साथ बॉर्डर कब थे थे नहीं इंडिया का इंडिया का कोई बॉर्डर नहीं थे चाइना से इफ देयर वाज एनी रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन इंडिया एंड चाइना इट वाज थ्रू द सी नॉट ऑन लैंड बॉर्डर चाइना नेवर हैड एनी बॉर्डर विद इंडिया 
If you go to any of the Himalayan regions, whether it's in Ladakh or Lahore, Spiti, Kinor or Sikkim or Bhutan, Nepal or Arunachal Pradesh, none of them have any past memory of having China on the other side or Chinese on the other side. It's, uh, you know, real memory of India, of China, started from 1962 Chinese invasion of Arunachal Pradesh. So at the moment, the, the, the borders that you see in, in, in red lines are three uh, sections, the eastern section, the middle section, and the western section. All of them put together is 3,488 kilometers of border. And uh, most importantly, the Arunachal Pradesh border was demarcated between Tibet and uh, British Empire. And India still uh, shows that document uh, what is called the MacMahon Treaty, signed on 24th of March 1914, which decided Arunachal Pradesh as part of India, because before that it was part of Tibet. Now it's part of India. The decision was made between Tibetan plenipotentiary Lunjin Sheta and British Empire uh, Sir Henry MacMahon. A British officer, uh, a Scottish officer in the British Empire. So they made the decision, and that's how Arunachal Pradesh became part of India. Most Indians don't know, but they would like to say, "Oh, Arunachal Hamara hai." Just the say, many Indians say, uh, "Kashmir Hamara hai." People actually don't know history, but bolte ja rahe. And but it's important to know, and then we can argue with the Chinese. So Arunachal became part of uh, part of India in. 1914. Now, if that document is the basis on which historically, legally, documentationally, if India is claiming that, then India must also recognize Tibet as a free and independent country because that was the father of Arunachal Pradesh that became part of India. But no, India is saying Tibet is a part of China, but Arunachal Pradesh is ours. And that makes India's Claim poor, yeah. Whether you agree or not, just you look at look at the uh, reasoning and and rationality of this, yeah. And uh, and why is China India saying Tibet is a part of China? Of course, there are many other reasons. So we will later uh, discuss on this. So this then you know connects the three angles in in the triangle. Um, India's uh, border in Sikkim, and uh, even today, uh, thousands of Chinese soldiers are standing there across the Sikkim border and uh, troubling India. Um, and up there, Lipu Lake, recently, uh, we have seen near Mount Kailash, uh, Brahmachalani has reported that, uh, that, that the Chinese have set up missile bases near Mount Kailash, uh, near uh, uh, Lake uh, Manasarovar. So you see what, what China is doing on, on the other side. All these in history had been Bet. Um, and right up to uh, 1946, uh, in 46, 47, India used to recognize Tibet as an independent country. And when uh, the first Asian relations conference happened, India, India invited Tibet to take part in the Asian relations conference to, to receive recognition for India as a free and independent country. Now, let me go back a little bit uh, to Tibet. Uh, what happened to Tibet and how Tibet became uh, part of China today? Uh, so, uh, in 1949, when China was becoming a communist uh, country, uh, Mao Zedong was the first chairman of the uh, Communist Party of China and therefore became the first president of People's Republic of China. Immediately, they try. They send military invasion into Tibet, Isturkistan, Mongolia, and Manchuria, and quickly captured all these neighboring countries. So the question is why? Why would a free, independent country of China immediately send military invasion to neighboring countries and capture them? And uh, what was the basis? Why? Because China thinks 
that the uh, when the revolution in China happened in 1911, 1911, you know, there was a revolution where they toppled the Manchu king, and China became free and independent country as um, uh, what is called the Republic of China. At the time, China. Uh, you know, the Chinese mind or the system that was going around at the time of 1910-11 was uh, when you topple um, an empire, you try to own all that the empire used to own. So inheritance of power. So China tried to do that in inheritance of power in 1911. Even at that time in 1911, China sent military invasion into Tibet. The Tibetans uh, uh, defeated the Chinese and uh, so they couldn't capture Tibet at that time in 1911. And right up to 1949, China was involved in internal struggle between the communists and the nationalists. And nationalists lost the battle. The uh, nationalist uh, uh, leader, uh, General um called um, Chiang Kai-shek, he escaped to Taiwan and established Republic of China in Taiwan. So that's how, how it happened. So in 1949, they came into Tibet, destroyed Tibetan Buddhism, killed people. Oh, more than a million Tibetans lost their lives in the Chinese invasion. And when Tibetans protested, look, look at this picture. Monk leading our protests in, in Tibet. This is a picture from 1987. So 87, 88, 89, there were major uh, uprising in Tibet, so they were protesting, and China literally clamped down on it militarily, killing people. Um, so these are pictures, and most people from outside they they have not seen it, they don't know, mainly because they th uh, firstly they are afraid of China, so no one wants to question China, and secondly they have trade benefits. Uh, they want to reap from China. So therefore, they never questioned China and China had always made, uh, you know, recognizing one China policy as a precondition to any kind of trade and political relationships. This is a, it's a recent picture. This is from 2012, how mm, the Chinese uh, military, they intimidate Tibetans, pin down on them, make them feel second citizens in, in Tibet. And daily there are these military parades, uh, sirens. Uh, sometimes some of the arrested Tibetans are paraded in front of everybody and show if you do not keep silent, you will be dealt with in this manner. And these people are executed. So any kind of protests in Tibet, within minutes, the protests are climbed down and killed and People are taken away, and all the family members and friends are rounded up. And that's how everything is suppressed in, in Tibet. There were, there were major protests that happened in 2008, and we lost more than 500 uh, Tibetans, and over 5,000 people got arrested, and some of them are still missing. So and then in 2008, 2009, 10, people started to come out in different uh, uh, modes of protest. Uh, so one of these things is, for example, uh, student protests. So the students were not uh, openly demanding independence as such. They were saying, you know, we, we as minorities in China, we must have the right to use our language. So this is a language protest that is happening in Amdo region of eastern part of Tibet. So uh, students, college students, school students, they're saying, uh, because at the time, China uh, was in the process of replacing Tibetan textbooks with Chinese textbooks. So the students started to protest, and thousands and thousands of students came out in the street and protest. And so this can this can, and look at this is an act of intimidation. There, this kind of parade, military parade, happens regularly. Uh, so look at look at this picture. Look at this picture. These are acts of intimidation, just to show, you know, we are powerful, you can't do anything to us, we rule the world, and no one in the world will save you, we are your gods.
this happens. Um, here is the, the, the picture of uh, the Potala Palace, and right, from, right in front of that is the uh, Chinese national flag, a constant reminder to the Tibetans that it is under China. Tibetans are traditionally nomads and far farmers, but now they are losing their land. As nomads, they need huge swathes of land uh, for grazing their yaks and sheep. And uh, uh, they're nomads. They, they don't live in one place. They have to have a summer pasture and then set up their sheep folds. And then they, during winter, they come down into the valleys. There also they have a, a different sheep fold to feed their animals. Uh, they have a tour of uh, dry hay to feed their animals. So they need a huge uh, swathes of land. But that's uh, an obstacle for, for China because Chinese interest is not Tibetan people, their culture or the animals. Their interest is mining. And they need to uh, remove the Tibetans from the pasture land. Look at this pasture land, you know. Tibet is like this. For kilometers and kilometers, it's just grassland. So there's, you see hundreds, thousands of sheep and yaks. And this is how Tibetans always lived in this world. Civilizations. Now what the Chinese China is doing is, China is doing exactly what the white Americans did in, in America. How they settled down the Native Americans into what is called the reservations. So they barbed wired a huge place of uh, the grassland and asked the Native Americans to live in, in that enclosure and give them enough money. And that, uh, became the death knell for the for the Native Americans. So therefore, today you see perhaps the last generation of Native Americans living. And that is exactly what the Chinese are attempting to do in Tibet. They are co-droning huge uh, pasture land and asking Tibetans to stay within. Then what happens is when you stay in a small enclosure with animals, the animals overgraze. And then the land turns into a desert. Earlier, this environmentally sustainable way of practice is that you take animals to one, uh, to during summer to one place where they graze, and the grazing herd keep moving and shift into different places. So therefore, the grassland is sustained in this most natural manner. But uh, but the Chinese interest is the land. They want to bomb the land. They want to take away the natural resources. So they have now settled down Tibetan nomads in this manner. Look at this. So these are artificial villages where small houses uh, are set up. So the nomads have, have been advised, lured into, or coerced or sometimes even forcibly told to settle down in these villages uh, so that the, the rest of the land is available for them for mining. And once a nomad is pigeonholed into these kind of matchbox uh, house, then they are busy, uh, you know, surviving for food, water connection, toilet, um, and they have never done uh, you know, industry, urban kind of jobs. So now they do dishwashers, dishwashing in Chinese restaurants. So entire Tibetan livelihood is changing. And, and still then Tibetans are resisting, not settling down, but living with small number of animals. A uh, huge forest have been clear felled and timbers taken to China um, and uh, feed uh, you know, ch Chinese industry. Mining, mining is the most lucrative business China is doing in Tibet. Mountains and mountains of land are bombed and uh, taken natural resources from there. And this is what is happening. See, trucks and trucks, millions of trucks are taking away natural resources from, from there and taking them to China, 
and that's how made in china products are cheap otherwise look natural resources are expensive and they are not for free but because china can do this in tibet in inner mongolia in east Turkestan, the natural resources they are drawing from tibet is free by suppressing the population in in these occupied countries that's why made in china products are cheap because the natural resources are free and from tibet china has been taking away gold copper silver chromite bauxite and most importantly lithium and rare earth china has said the largest amount of lithium and rare earth they have been digging up in amdu region of eastern tibet so now you see when china threatens to uh, you know boycott america or other countries punish them by by banning to send uh, uh, supply chain of of uh, rare earth uh, any and and materials for semi uh, semiconductors we now know they are sourcing them from tibet so look at this uh, the picture in um, at the end uh, right in the center the 2.5 million square kilometer of land important origins of all the important rivers and and how it's right there in the center and how this could play a very important role okay so this is my presentation i'll now get back to uh, showing you my face um, okay so let me briefly speak about uh, china uh, and manchuria and then uh, we can talk about the rest so what had happened is in 1911 uh, when the revolution happened in 1912 when the people's republic of uh, Kazakhstan, republic of china was founded uh, that was the time when china looked at uh, itself and its relationship with with the neighboring countries were, was very different so at the time uh, the narrative was that Manchu was a foreign uh, was a uh, foreign uh, colonial power who had ruled over China, and now that we have toppled them, we must have the right to inherit uh, colonies, properties that used to be part of the uh, Manchu Empire, or it uh, or its influence on on any of the countries. The relationship between the Manchus and the Tibetans is. Um, that the Tibet Tibet was a protectorate for Manchus, like how, for example, uh, Bhutan is uh, a protectorate for India. But Bhutan is free in free in independent country. Bhutan is not part of uh, India today. Yeah, uh, but Bhutan's military protection is is un, uh, is under under India, and it's a um, it's a deal between Bhutan and India. Uh, similarly. Because the Manchus were powerful, uh, the Tibetan deal with the Manchus is that the Tibetan lamas, Buddhist leaders would give Buddhist teachings to Manchuria, Manchurian king, and Manchus would give military protection to Tibet. So therefore, uh, when we look at uh, Sikkim border, when we look at Ladakh border, you will see uh, in some places, uh, Manchu representatives talked to British Empire. And it's not Chinese. I think um, in the Doglam issue, India made this mistake. India made this mistake in, during the Doglam issue. When when the Doglam issue was going on, China brought in the old Manchu British Empire deal of 1870 uh, Manchu British Empire relationship and india recognized that as a chinese document it's a it's indian mistake because once you do this then you have to recognize 
entire history of Manchuria as history of China. Serious mistake. Because real China emerged in 1911. 1912 was Republic of China. If you do not recognize squarely China as Republic of China or People's Republic of China founded in 1914. In fact, India for India, it is important to go back only up to 1949 and say in 1949, People's Republic of China is founded because we are talking about PRC, we are not talking about ROC because ROC is in Taiwan. So we cannot go back to Manchu as a Chinese history or Republic of China as Chinese history. The real history of People's Republic of China is the China we are talking about. So therefore, when we do this, then we will see in history, Tibet was free in an independent country, and that was the country which had relationship with British Empire. Or even after that in 1947, right? or 1956, for example, where in 1956, during the celebration of 2,500 years of the Buddha Jayanti, the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan Buddhist leader Penchen Lama were invited to India as representatives of Tibet as an independent country. Yeah, so I think these are important uh, arguments that needed to come about and find strength in Indian uh, in, uh, in in India's um, arguments. Uh, otherwise, you know, I I see that China. Chinese narratives has been bought over because they are, uh, you know, by media they are powerful and they've been buying Indian intellectuals and people in the media live, left, right and center. And therefore, Chinese narrative has become overimposing even in India. So when you do that, then, then you lose your argument. So I think these are uh, important. Um, so I've now spoken for quite a long time. And uh, I will now take questions. And if you have questions, perhaps you can, because, uh, on the Facebook Live, uh, you can type your questions and then we can discuss. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, looking at the uh, Facebook uh, post. If you have any of your questions, you ask, uh, write your questions and ask. At the moment, I see there are 17 people who are watching this. So ask any uh, question uh, related to what, what I said. Uh, uh, there may be um, uh, disagreements with, with some of the things I said, or you have a comment about what, what I said. So if there's any question, uh, you're, you're welcome to ask. Yeah. Um, so Naresh, yes, Naresh Nakshane has a, has a question. Yes, yes, Naresh, yes, ask, ask the question. Yes, Naresh ji. Yeah, I'm waiting for question. Naresh ji, yes, what is your question? Or any other, whatever questions you have, you may just type in uh, on the Facebook Live um, and then we can discuss. Okay, so uh, while we uh, wait for uh, uh, questions there, um, I also want to add um, recently when, when the Galwan Valley, uh, this thing happened, um, Tibetans inside Tibet were very concerned. Uh, and I think their main concern was uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's security. Um, and some people even suggested that if things uh, go worse, then they may be dangerous on him. So therefore he, uh, some people suggested that he should be shifted to South India uh, because China could do anything. And now, um, you know, the Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese one country today, they are not cared about the image or whatever they do. They have been, you know, picking up enmity with everybody, all their China's uh, neighboring countries and uh, even America. Yeah. Okay. Here is a question. Place in Ladakh, uh, Changpa, Changtang, 
culture is seen in Tibet, uh, like festivals, oracles uh, say about. Yeah, of course, um, uh, Ladakh in history, many, many uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, used to be almost uh, kind of an extension of the Western Tibet uh, land and culture. Uh, even today, if you go to Ladakh, uh, the language they speak, the script they write, and the dress that they wear, uh, most are the same. And in fact, uh, Tibetans consider uh, Ladakhi language as one of the dialects of, uh, of, of Tibetan. But there is also the Ladakhi uh, Nash, uh, nationalism, which says that Ladakhi uh, language is Boti and it's a little different and it's said differently. But then these kind of uh, dialects are, are in all across Tibet, so many different dialects are, are also there. Uh, so therefore, uh, cultural practices, whether they are nomads or farmers, um, um, in, in history, uh, Tibet and Ladakh are like two huge, uh, not, not, not entirely entire Tibet, because that's very big, yeah? We are talking about 2.5 million square kilometers of land, particularly the western part of Tibet in Rudok area, Tahigang area, or Tungari region, Purang region. These are very close to Ladakh, and therefore the landscape is almost the same. If you actually go to Ladakh, I don't know how many of you, um, at the moment, uh, there are 15 people who are participating in this. Um, uh, people in Ladakh, um, uh, if you have been there, you would see the landscape, the Pangung Lake, or you, where you, the three idiot shooting and all that happened. You know, it's nothing different from how Tibet looks like today. So the Tibetan nomads uh, look like Ladakhi nomads, short statured people and speak very fast. Um, it's the Ladakhi uh, accent, but in Western Tibet, it's the uh, Nari accent. So um, there is a similarity, uh, but at the same time today, Ladakh is part of India. It's a unique territory. It's a clear decision. There is a, a clear demarcated border between Tibet and Ladakh. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, Shitij Rator's question is, what about 15th Dalai Lama? Now, Tibetan people, so the importance of, uh, of Dalai Lama, I think it's important to understand because Dalai Lama is not like a, like a Pope, you know, uh, who, who is elected by a, by a, by a board of members and uh, uh, who is, uh, anybody could be a Pope, yeah? Uh, because the Dalai Lama, uh, the idea of it, uh, is, it comes from the rebirth, you know, the karma. Um, rebirth. Um, in rebirth, uh, the essential, essential thing is to understand the soul. Soul of a person who uh, tra gets transferred into the next life, into the next body. Um, and that same person must uh, come back again and again. Yeah? So the 14th Dalai Lama who's here uh, is the continuity of 14 Dalai Lamas. Uh, starting from 15th century. Uh, for 400 years, uh, the Dalai Lama institution gave political and spiritual leadership uh, to the Tibetan people. They have been, they have been one uh, who have been running um, this institution, institution of the Dalai Lama and giving leadership uh, to, to Tibet. So therefore, 14 Dalai Lama today is in exile. Uh, it had never happened in, in, in history that uh, Dalai Lama had to spend almost his entire life uh, in exile in this way. But uh, the 14th Dalai Lama is not just in exile, he is ended up becoming the most popular uh, Tibetan ever in history. Uh, he is much loved and respected by people around the world. Even in India, there's so much of love for, for the Dalai Lama. And that's, that's his uniqueness. You know, he has emerged as someone who is so lovable, so adoring, uh, people love and respect him. Um, so he's now 85. Yeah. So 6th July recently was was his birthday. Uh, he's now 85. He says, "I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm healthy." I'm, he said, "You know, he's going to live for another 15-20 uh, years." So um, these are these are good signs for for Tibetans. Um, but I think the idea of 15th Dalai Lama 
Uh, firstly, for Tibetans, uh, Tibetans have overwhelming love and faith in, in the Dalai Lama. So they would want the Fitrin Dalai Lama to come in whatever the situation is. The Dalai Lama has been saying, uh, I personally have no attachment to the idea and the institution of the Dalai Lama. So I don't have to insist that I must come back in the 15th uh, form. He says, it depends on the Tibetan people. If Tibetan people want and need the Dalai Lama, they will be 15th. So the Dalai Lama is, has indicated that it is Tibetan people who will decide. Now, Tibetan people, of course, out of their faith, they would want. Now, the strength of your question is not about Tibetan people, I know. It's about the power of the 15th Dalai Lama, who, uh, when would he come? How would he be recognized? What would be the dynamics of relationship between, the, between that 15th Dalai Lama and India? And what if the issue of Tibet is not resolved at that time? I think these questions will also depend not just on Tibetan people. It will depend on international relationships. How does China look at uh, the issue of Tibet? How does uh, India, how will India look at uh, Tibet um, or, or the Dalai Lama? For example, many Indians has, uh, are and have been saying that Dalai Lama should be given um, uh, the the Bharat Ratna uh, award. Yeah, but India has been not taking uh, heart and not taking the courage to to do that. Uh, because India has been over cautious in thinking that what would China think? Uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. Now, now perhaps it's it's a time. Yeah. But then I also feel that you know giving uh, Bharat Ratna to, to the Dalai Lama is to not be just a political act, to be genuine Indian people's uh, love and respect. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, so in future, uh, what is going to happen in China? Will China change? Will China collapse? Will China become more powerful? And how would India look at China? At the moment, there is isolation of China. There is there is fall of business, trade, production, uh, jobs uh, in China. So China is in a terrible situation today. But will it continue? Will China uh, once again uh, re-emerge and perhaps replace uh, America? We don't know. So I think um, the importance of the 15th Dalai Lama will truly depend on these many factors. And um, uh, the Dalai Lama has indicated that um, if there is 15th Dalai Lama, if the issue of Tibet is not resolved, he said he would leave behind written uh, instructions where would where the 15th Dalai Lama would be would be found and rec and and how the recognition uh, should happen. So anyway, that's so that is my answer now. Uh, Sajul has the question, uh, re repeat the India's mistake in China, Manchuria, and why mistake happens. And also you said uh, that there is some Hindu also live in there. So how is their condition against Chinese? Hindu? Okay, first part of the question I was saying, uh, I was looking at the Doglam issue. So when the Doglam issue was uh, coming about, so both India and China, they were uh, coming about with historical documents and, and, and things like that. Um, India was uh, talking about Arunachal, uh, saying that this is part of the McMahon Treaty. Uh, but when it came to Sikkim, uh, there was no McMahon Treaty. It was uh, the, the 1870 uh, treaty between the British Empire and the Manchu representative who was in Tibet at that time. So China was using the Manchu document in order to show that the Manchu narrative or the Manchu uh, king uh, was one of the kings of China and therefore China today has legitimate control over Tibet. So and, and if India, because India at the time did not uh, content that, did not question that narrative. And therefore, uh, India, I think that is the uh, uh, mistake that India made. India should have questioned, because at the time, it was the Manchu king who was ruling over China. It was not in uh, Chinese king. It was the Manchu empire. And Manchus 
uh, were toppled later. And the real China emerged in 1911. So India should have questioned that. And when India did not, silence is considered agreement. So therefore, once India bought this Manchu narrative as Chinese narrative, then India will have to extend Chinese history back into, um, to, into history for almost about 250 years to say uh, China is much bigger. So therefore, India needs to look into niche corners, corners to understand Chinese history uh, of Manchu rule over China, uh, China emerging in, in 1911 revolution and 1912 uh, becoming a Republic of China. Um, and even that Republic of China later escapes to Taiwan. And today's legitimate government of, uh, uh, of China, that is People's Republic of China, emerged in 1949. So therefore, I think India should rework on China's po China policy and look at China only from the strength of 1949. What was the relationship between Tibet and India before 1949? For example, in 46, during the F, uh, Asian Relations Conference, uh, representative or representative of independent Tibet came to India to part in Asian Relations Conference in the presence of Gandhiji. So this shows that India and Tibet shared relationship of equal status as independent countries. 1947, 48. So for almost about uh, two years, India and Tibet shared equal status as a free and independent country. In 1949, China invaded Tibet. In 1950, uh, Tibet lost a major battle uh, against China. Um, and then in 1951, China uh, imposed what is called the 17-point agreement which made Tibet an autonomous region uh, under China, yeah, 51. So China today is constantly showing this document, 1951 document, uh, to show how Tibet willingly uh, exceeded its authority to China. And China says this is peaceful liberation. In fact, China led a military invasion into Tibet and killed hundreds and thousands. And that's how the 14th Dalai Lama had to escape Tibet come to India, seek refuge in 1959. So since 1959, the Dalai Lama has been here in India. Um, your second part of the question where you were saying also, you said that, that there, are, there is some Hindu also live in there. So you mean, uh, you seem to say, perhaps the only point you may be referring to is, I'm talking about uh, Mount Kailash. So I was saying Mount Kailash is, um, is considered the center of the earth. It's loved and wo it's worshipped by Hindus, Jains, Buddhists, and many people uh, around the world. I was talking about that. Um, uh, otherwise, um, uh, Hindus in Tibet would be perhaps some Nepalis who may have moved to Tibet and lived there uh, over many years. Um, and also, uh, you know, mixed marriages. Um, yeah, so very, very few. Uh, but uh, within the Tibetan community, uh, we would say 90, 95, 96% of Tibetans are, are, are Buddhist. And the remaining are some uh, Muslim Tibetans and some Christian Tibetans. And of course, an atheists who would not adhere to any of the uh, religions. Yeah, so that's the third thing. Okay, now next question. Ankid uh, uh, Sajulji, if you are not happy with this, uh, answer or if there is something if you if you had asked something else then um, you may uh, write your question again so ankit um, ramtig is asking sir is it possible that in future chinese economy will collapse so in what circumstances chinese economy can collapse okay um i'm not an economist so i cannot speak too much i can look at only politically how uh, because e economy and and politics are, are related. Uh, sometimes financial crisis can lead into political upheaval, and sometimes political situation can cause a financial crisis. Yeah, um, I think in uh, compared to compared to India, India India is you know uh, self-consumption economy. Yeah, 
major portion of Indian production is consumed by Indian population itself. Um, and our export uh, contribution to GDP is very, very small. But China, uh, their export is the major part of their GDP. And especially now, because of the COVID-19, because of Chinese hostilities with its neighbor, neighboring countries, Chinese export has fallen because it's, it's fallen and the goods are stranded at the airports, at the, um, at the ports and harbors. Even when they, are, when they have reached other places, many people today, many of the countries do not want to receive products from China. Yeah, and some of them are blatant, openly boycotting Chinese products. So therefore, China, Chinese production has fallen, Chinese export has fallen, and um, trade war with, with Donald Trump's country, this has been going on from 2018. So there is a major problem uh, that China is facing. So because of this economic constipation, it is uh, causing uh, loss of jobs in China, uh, fall in investments, and these are serious questions uh, in China. And uh, much of it is mainly happening because of political reasons. Um, Ban of 59 uh, abs in India also led to a ban of TikTok and Tencent and Huawei um, in America, and which may be followed up by some of the uh, other Western countries like, like in Europe or Canada or even Australia. So these are going to be serious uh, problems uh, for, for, India, uh, for, for China in, in the coming years. Um, so if that happens, Chinese people will blame Xi Jinping for his policies, for his hostile, confrontational policies. And um, so this blame will, um, uh, I think, could uh, trigger questioning the government, questioning the authority, uh, which had never happened up until today. Because the government had always been very clever in deflecting um, uh, criticisms to uh, to foreign invasion, uh, threats from outside, and all the time saying we have to stay united because uh, we have too many enemies on the outside. So America is, is an enemy, China is, because uh, Japan is an enemy, Australia, India, Philippines, Vietnam, everybody's an enemy you know, for China today. So these are uh, tactics that have been, but this cannot uh, go on, this cannot sustain. Uh, Okay, so I think I have cleared all questions. Uh, Sajil, you are also okay. Uh, Vijay ji, any other question? Um, yeah, we are still eleven people. Any other question? If you have, <clears throat> yeah. So anyway, um, so uh, whatever is going on, oh, someone is is uh, Ashe. Ashe uh, Partate, Partate is saying, is conversation of culture or the Manchus possible? Converse, conservation, conservation of culture. Okay, Manchus is very difficult because Manchus, um, even after the fall of the Manchu Empire, uh, most Manchus, out of fear, of maintaining Manchu identity, they integrated into the mainland uh, Chinese uh, by race, by culture, mixed marriages, and loss of language. Um, yeah, one of the things I, I forgot to say, um, in 1911, when, when the Manchu Empire was toppled, when China became free and independent, many of the Chinese, they cut their hair so most of the Chinese at the time, especially men, they used to have their hair tied into a ponytail. And um, uh, it's, it's called the pigtail, Chinese pigtail. And they cut it. Why? Because the keeping pigtail hairstyle for men was a Manchu culture. And Manchus, because they were powerful, they imposed this on the Chinese. So you see some of the, uh, you know, Jackie Chan Kung Fu Karate or uh, 
uh, you'll see uh, many of them used to have these pigtails. This shows how the Chinese were adhering to Manchu culture and they used to have that. So in 1911, when the uh, revolution happened, when China became free and independent, all of them came out into the street as an act of political act of, uh, ex, uh, you know, rebellion on, uh, against the Manchus and to show that, uh, that China is now free and independent. They celebrated that, they had a ceremony to cut the pigtails and say, we are now free and independent. Um, if you want to see uh, a part of that history, you should watch this Jackie Chen film called 1911. Yeah. So I'm on the on the uh, on the Facebook. I'm going to write uh, this name of the film. Jackie Chan film. Uh, 1911. Okay, so I've done that. So 1911 is an important uh, Jackie Chan film. Um, it's kind of uh, historical. Um, I should say hysterical <laughs> because Jackie Chan loves being funny and all of that. Uh, his importance of uh, making this film. This was made in 19 uh, uh, 2011 to celebrate 100 years of Chinese independence. Uh, but he was he, he's always funny and he lost the important, political importance of it. So you should watch this film called 1911. There you will see uh, how Jackie Chan plays this martyr, freedom fighter who dies at the end, um, like Amitabh Bachchan in Shole, uh, towards the end, like, ah, I'm a martyr, you know, hero, that kind of thing. So Jackie Chan dies in the, in the, in the film and, um, uh, this is to show, um, and there you will actually see the cutting of the picture. Uh, so anyway, essentially, uh, to answer your question, yes, um, now it's too difficult for, for Manchus to regain um, uh, the past uh, culture uh, because they are completely integrated into Chinese. Uh, but idea of Manchu is still there. But I think more than that is the, is the, is the success of Chinese narrative. Yeah. Uh, so in, 19, in 1911, China was saying Manchu used to rule over us, and because we are toppled Manchus, whatever authority uh, Manchus used to hold must come under us. Was the inheritance of power? That's that was Chinese argument. Then in 1949, uh, the Chinese argument, what is called the peaceful liberation, China was saying that. Uh, these neighboring countries uh, who were part of China, now look at this, who were part of China, because of Manchu Empire, uh, they're saying they must be liberated from foreign occupation. Um, and, and also from, uh, because they were, they were co communists, so the, the communist defense was that Tibet was a feudal society aristocratic run society. So we need to liberate Tibet. So this, these are the political and the communist defense with which they invaded Tibet. So at the time of 1949-1950, the inv invasion of Tibet in East Pakistan, their difference was very different. Then in 1970s, when late 70s, when Deng Xiaoping came into power, he was saying, uh, you know, let us develop China. Let us make China rich. And um, as his maxim says, um, um, it doesn't matter whether the mouse is black or white. No, it, it doesn't matter whether the cat is black or white. As long as the cat catches a, my, uh, a mouse, it's a good cat. Uh, so, so immorality and, um, and usability. Uh, was the maxim, and therefore uh, it became a very new and different kind of China. Then, uh, from the, from Jiang Zemin on uh, onwards, then the, they started to change history. So they ch started to rewrite history. So now they are saying, today uh, China is saying, Manchu was one of the dynasties of China, and therefore entire history 
land people of Manchuria is a is a part of Chinese history and they do not look at Manchuria as a uh, free and separate and uh, foreign now they look at Manchu as part of China not only this they go back into history it's this is colonization of history so they go back into history and now they say Mongolians Genghis Khan Kublai Khan they are saying that is also a history of China Mongolians are no different and they are and have always been part of China now they go back almost a thousand years back and they say Tibet had always been a part of China Tibetans are Chinese so this is colonization not just of the land and people colonization of history and this revisionist history is the idea behind one China policy and whosoever trades with China they have to agree on one China policy today 160 countries are trading with China and all of them have accepted to one China policy and therefore even today after Galvan Valley India is finding it difficult to uh, uh, you know junk its one China policy Okay, uh, Shitish Rator is asking, what is India's stance on Arunachal? So, uh, India is saying, uh, Chinese claim is that uh, Arunachal Pradesh is part of southern Tibet and therefore it should come under uh, Chinese occupation or um, under China. Uh, India is saying, because India talks about a McMahon Treaty and uh, McMahon Treaty is very important um, because Mac uh there should be one map somewhere okay let me show you one map mm. let me show you one map a map and and also the uh mcmohan treaty uh sign uh Okay, this picture. Look at this. This is McMahon Treaty. Yeah. Um, I'll enlarge it for you. See? Map showing India China frontier as mutually agreed upon by the British and Tibetan plenipotentiaries. Yeah. And you see uh, British plenipotentiaries. This is uh, Mac Henry McMahon signature on top and uh, his signature his seal is to the left on the map and the red seal uh, below British plenipotentiary is the seal of the Tibetan plenipotentiary and it's written here uh, his name is there. So this is Lunchin Sheta uh, representing Tibet. Uh, so this is signed. Look at this, the date, 24th of uh, 24th March, uh, 1914. So this is India's argument. India is saying so the uh, McMahon Treaty was signed uh, Brit between British Empire and Tibet. And, and therefore, uh, since that date, uh, entire region of Arunachal Pradesh is part of, uh, part of, part of India. And uh, this, look at, the, look at the region. This is 90,000 square kilometer of land. And 
later uh, they had the similar agreement later they had the similar agreement uh, where um, this picture uh, that I'm showing you this is uh, Asian relations conference um, 1946 where you see here uh, Tibet Tibetan leader was representing uh, as a leader of free and independent Tibet and you see Gandhiji there So anyway, um, uh, so that is India's argument. So, so, so let us look, go back to yeah. So that is India's argument, and um, India's argument uh, stands. And um, uh, so, therefore, China has no argument uh, on this. Uh, so China has been, you know, picking and choosing. China is saying they want to go back to 1870 agreement on british empire and manchu empire but they don't want to go back on british empire and tibet uh, document on uh, mcmohan treaty so look look at this what why china is doing pick and choose they want to go into history about sikkim but they don't want to go back into a history of uh, arunachal pradesh because there um, uh, China loses because uh, that uh, 1914 that document happened and that war document uh, the, the 1914 uh, McMahon Treaty uh, was about border between Tibet and India and um, after that in the month of July uh, the meeting happened in, um, in, in Shimla and there what is called the Shimla, Shimla uh, Convention um, the British Empire, the Chinese, and the Tibetans were brought together, uh, uh, and they were to talk about um, the composite. Firstly, give recognition to McMahon Treaty. They did not uh, oppose this. China did not oppose McMahon Treaty. China's opposition at the at the similar convention was about Tibet and. Um, Tibet and uh, and China border, because at the time, what what the British is very cle very cleverly what they did. Of course, they would uh, they would keep their interests first, not about Tibetan interest or Chinese interest. What what British Empire did was they cut up Tibet into two different portions: inner Tibet, outer Tibet. Outer Tibet is what major portion is what 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 is called uh, Tibet Autonomous Region today. Inner Tibet is a huge chunk of land which British Empire says this is a suzerain uh, authority where China seems to be having authority but Tibet has uh, autonomy there. But TAR or the Tibet Autonomous Region or the, what is called the Outer Tibet, British Empire were, uh, at that time they were saying um, this is a sovereign Tibet. Yeah. So look at Look at this this uh, this uh, position here. So uh, what the Britishers were doing? Even then, uh, the Tibetans signed the document. Britishers signed the document. Uh, uh, Chinese uh, um, uh, representative at the time uh, signed it, but did not seal it. They withdrew at the last moment, and there. Uh, contention was not about McMahon Treaty. Their yeah, contention was about Tibet and Chinese border. Because they were claiming more areas in the in the in the border demarcation. So this is something we all uh, need to know. Uh, when China uh, says that that they uh, did not sign uh, McMahon uh, did not sign similar agreement, uh, their problem was about. Uh, Tibet China border and not about Indian border. Okay, so done. Uh, Vijayji, what shall we do? Uh, shall we close now? If there are any other question? If there's no other question, we'll close it here. Okay, so I'm going to uh, close here. Uh, Vijayji, thank you very much for inviting me.
And um, uh, I thank all the people in the audience. There are 11 of you. Uh, earlier there were a little more, but now it's 11. So anyway, um, all my good wishes to all of you. Uh, it is very important that we must have educated IAS officers. We must have fair officers, uh, people who take courage to uh, provide justice. Um, and also, uh, you know, you are aspiring to uh, provide leadership uh, to India. And uh, it is important to work compassionately, you know. Uh, they'll say uh, compassion is, is the only uh, red, uh, you know, uh, rudder, uh, one that gives you direction that will never make any mistake in your life. So always be compassionate because compassion is the real strength. There's no bigger power than compassion. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and, and be kind. And um, that will hugely help you wherever you go, whether you are a boss or whether you are servants, whether you are staff or so, whatever you do, uh, uh, you know, compassion will provide you the best direction in life. So, um, um, I'm a little older to you, so <laughs> or one or two pre advices. So anyway, thank you, thank you everybody. Um, uh, I wish you all my good wishes that you you uh, clear your uh, papers and uh, become Indian uh, leaders. Okay, thank you, uh, Vijayji, for inviting me. So I will now end here. Thank you.